thank you, uh, Alexis. <laughs> All right. And so, uh, solid solid is another example. Brass is another example of solution. Even the gold in your jewelry is a solution because gold is not a, is not pure gold. It's an alloy. Okay. Now. We, we talked about polarity and we and and the thing here to remember is like dissolves like is the rule. And so polar solutes will dissolve in polar solvents. Okay. And nonpolar solutes will dissolve in nonpolar solvents. Um, good example is this. We we got nonpolar and polar, they're not gonna mix. For example, uh, an oil spill. Oils are, are made up mostly of hydrocarbons, mostly carbon and hydrogen, which are very nonpolar. And so they will not mix in, in, um, in a water solution. So that's why we got a big mess. Now, normally we use the term soluble, insoluble, but when we're dealing with two liquids, okay, and they do mix, then we, we call that miscible. If they do not mix, then it's immiscible. Okay. When we're dealing with liquids, with liquid solute and a liquid solvent. When we're dealing with a solid in the liquid, we use the term soluble or insoluble. Okay. So with respect to ionic compounds and aqueous systems, we have to look at the refresher memory or remember how to use the solubility rules to determine whether it is insoluble or soluble. And also keep in mind, even though it's, it's an ionic compound and it's classified as insoluble, it just means that it's a weak electrolyte. There are some ions that go in solution, but the bulk of it still remains in solid form, okay? Now here, we have a table and they're asking you the question, well, which of these solutes dissolve in these solids? Well, to answer these type of questions, we first had to determine the polarity. See, it's all tied in, okay, with what we did before. You know, to determine the polarity, we have to re uh, remember about polar bonds and nonpolar bonds. And then if the, if the polar bonds cancel each other out, then, you know, the molecule becomes nonpolar. If the polar bonds do not cancel out, then it's a polar uh, uh, compound. And so here the solvent is three of them down the first column. NH3, which hopefully you know by now is called ammonia. And then C12H26, that's a big carbon, hydrocarbon. Don't really have to know what it is, but recognize that it's made, made up of nothing but carbon and hydrogen, okay? And then Br2. And so first let's determine, well, before we do that, let's go to the solute. Okay, we got the first one, HCl, hydrochloric acid, that we talked about in the past. That's a very polar covalent bond. Then we got I2 or iodine, which is nonpolar because the two iodine atoms are have the same electron activity, so therefore they'll have a covalent bond. It's a nonpolar covalent bond. Then PCl3, obviously the phosphorus and the chlorides have a polar bond, but when we do the Lewis dot structure, and you know, see how it's all tied in. When we do the Lewis dot structure, we find out that phosphorus has a lone pair of electrons in the central atom, which like I mentioned before, when that happens, automatically we got a polar component, in this case, polar compound. And then CH4, that's methane. Again, you may not know what it is, but you do recognize hopefully that it's made up of nothing but carbon and hydrogen, which tells you we have a nonpolar species. Now, we know that ammonia, NH3, is polar. Again, going to the Lewis dot structure, we end up with lone pair in the nitrogen, okay? Even though nitrogen and hydrogen have polar bonds, because of the lone pair, uh, they have the, uh, the structure trig uh, 
uh, excuse me, trigonopyramid, pyramid, and therefore it's polar. CH H26 again, polar nonpolar bonds, all of them, carbon hydrogen, so that's a nonpolar species, and then Br2, like we did with iodine, that's also nonpolar. Okay. Now, as you go through this, also keep in mind what the last chapter of IMF. If we look at ammonia, we determine it's polar. And then the question could be asked, well, okay, what's the IMF in interaction for ammonia? Well, you know, it's, it's uh, NOF, remember, not on file, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, fluoride, hydrogen bonded to nitrogen. So here we got hydrogen bridging. Uh, C12H26, it's nonpolar London forces. Br2 and bromine, nonpolar automatically London forces. Okay. HCl, we talked at length about this. It's a polar bond, polar covalent bond. Iodine, like bromine, is nonpolar. Then PCl3, if we don't don't know what it is as far as polarity. We can, we can uh, do the Lewis side structure and we end up like ammonia, same type of structure with a lone pair on, on phosphorus, which tells us polar compound. And then solute uh, NH4 nonpolar. And so once we determine this, the polarity of the solute and the solvent, now we can determine what dissolves and what doesn't. Okay, because like dissolves like. And so, yes, the first ammonia and hydrochloric acid, they will dissolve in each other because they're both polar. As we go across the table, we get a no for iodine and ammonia simply because iodine is nonpolar. Okay, we got yes for uh, trichlor uh, phosphorus trichloride because they're both polar both the solvent and the solute, and then a no for NH4 because it's nonpolar, okay? Going across with the hydrocarbon solvent, we got a no for hydrochloric acid because we're dealing with a polar and a nonpolar species. And this is similar for, you know, those of you ladies that use makeup and trying to remove that makeup. Most of the makeup out there, you know, you got to use an oil-based cleanser to get that makeup off. So what does that infer that the makeup is? The makeup is a very nonpolar species. There's also makeup up there that comes off with soap and water. That infers that that makeup is, is more, has more polar character and that's why it can be washed off with water. Okay. Uh, iodine and, and hydrocarbon C12, they're going to dissolve. Okay, simply because they're not both nonpolar. Obviously, no for the next combination, and yes for the methane combination. And we can go through the same exercise and go across, and we get a no for bromine and hydrochloric acid. Okay, bromine and iodine, definitely yes, both nonpolar species. Bromine and uh, phosphor trichloride, we, that's a no because of polar nonpolar. And finally, at the end, the last, the last combination, we get a yes as far as solubility, okay? So, <clears throat> so if you're ever given a table like this or you're being asked to determine does ammonia, uh, if ammonia is a solvent, would it, dissolve, would it dissolve iodine? Well, to answer that, first determine the polarity of the molecule. And if they're both the same polarity, then they will dissolve because like dissolves like. Okay, with respect to naming things that are miscible and immiscible, uh, we got a polar liquid and a polar solvent, two liquids, so we use the term miscible. Okay, when we have a polar liquid and a nonpolar solvent, again, two liquids, they don't mix because of the polarity. It's immiscible. And the next example, nonpolar liquid, polar solvent, immiscible due to polarity. And it is miscible due to, again, polarity, nonpolar, non, nonpolar liquid, nonpolar solvent. 
polar solid, solid, polar solvent, soluble. Because here we got a solid and a liquid interaction. Then the next one would be insoluble because we got a solid and a liquid solvent. It's insoluble if it's a nonpolar solid and a polar uh, solvent, okay? And soluble. If we have an ionic compound and a polar solvent, the answer is maybe. And that's determined by the solubility of the ionic compound. Now, with respect to ionic solid and nonpolar, definitely insoluble. Classic example, you put oil in a pan to cook something, you throw a little salt on that pan, that sodium chloride, that salt will not dissolve in that oil, okay? All right, so um, th th we mentioned this briefly before when we were talking about IMF interaction, but basically here, the solvent molecules are being solvated by water, again, because of the polarity of water in the dipole and water. And so the partial negative side in the oxygen is surrounding the sodium ion uh, for sodium chloride and for sodium here. And the chloride, if this was sodium chloride, would be interacting with the partial positive of the water of the hydrogens. Okay, with respect to concentration, there's two types of, of uh, units that were, or not units, but two types of concentration values that we're going to use. One of them is called mass percent, okay? And that simply is the ratio of the weight of the solute divided by the total weight of the solute and the solvent, okay? Now, with respect to the other one called molarity, here's moles. You thought you were going to get away from it, right? No. Moles, once we calculate the moles of a, of a compound, Okay, and divided by the volume of the solvent that we're going to dissolve this compound, we have a unit called molarity uh, denoted by the capital M. It has the units of moles per liter. So let's do one, of, one example here. All right, so they're asking you calculate the mass percent, and that's the key word, they'll say mass percent for 15 grams of potassium nitrate being dissolved in the 135 grams of water. And so we know that the mass percent is given is the mass of the solute, which is 15 grams of potassium nitrate, divided by the mass of the solution, which includes the mass of the solute and the mass of the solvent. Let me highlight that, which is right, which is right there. Okay. Therefore, we take 15 plus 135. That's in our denominator, and then we take 15. That's the solute. We divide that times 100 to give us a percentage, keeping track of our sig figs. So. For that solution, it has a 10% uh, mass percent, okay, 10%. Clear my drawings. Okay, there we go. Now let's, let's uh, uh, <laughs> give you the answer here. Well, I set it up. Sometimes you don't know how much water or s solvent to use, okay? But you may be given uh, the amount of solute. In this example, they're asking you to calculate how many grams of water are needed to make a 5% saline solution if you have 10 grams of solvent, okay? So we're gonna have to use a little bit of algebra here. Nothing too complicated. And so this, we set that up as of the follows, okay? They're asking us to do 5%. So 5% is equal to that quantity in parentheses. They give us 10 grams of salt. So we can put 10 in the numerator. 
divided by 10 plus x. What we don't know is x. Because that is what is being asked to calculate the amount of water utilized. And so we have a algebraic equation and then here and we get a solve for x. Okay. Now there's a multiple ways to do this algebraic equation. One way is not more correct than the other way. The point is you want to get you want to isolate x. Okay. So one way here is what they did is they divided they multiply both sides of the equation by 10 plus x. Okay. And in doing so, we got rid of the 10 plus x on the right side of the equation and moved it over to the left side of the equation. See how, was, how that was done? Okay. The next step was they went ahead and multiplied the 10 times 100 to give you 1,000. Okay. Now, at this point, you can do this in multiple ways. You can take the 5 here and times the quantity 10 and just multiply across 5 times 10, 5 times x, distribute. That's one way to do it. The other way is you can take that 5 and divide through by 5 in both sides of the equation to give you that. So now you've isolated 10 plus x is equal to 1,000 divided by 5. Okay. And then 1,000 divided by 5 is 200. And now you have 10 plus x is equal to 200. Now we want to solve for x. So to get 10 from the left side over to the right, we subtract 10 from both sides of the equation. And that gives us 190 grams. So x is equal to 190 grams. Well, how do we know that's correct? Well, you simply put 190 grams back into the original equation and do the math. And both sides of the equation should add, should have 5 is equal to 5, which tells you that x, how you calculate it, is correct. Okay. Now, we put it in uh, scientific notation simply because sig figs, okay? Uh, 5.00 is the quantity that determines the sig figs because 10 and 100 are exact numbers. So 5.00 is determines uh, our sig figs. That's three sig figs, 5.00. Therefore, our answer should, if we write it 190 grams, that's only two sig figs. So by writing it into scientific notation, there's no question about the uh, significant figures, because there's three, the way it's written in, in scientific notation. Okay, with respect to molarity, again, you need to calculate the number of moles. Now, when we have uh, grams of a compound and we need moles, we need the molar mass. Okay, we, we did the molar mass in the last chapter. We add up all the atoms, and that's our add up all the atoms and uh, for that compound, and that gives us the molar mass, which has the units of grams per mole. So if we take the grams given and divide by the molar mass, it gives us moles. And then if we divide that by the volume that we're going to dissolve this, we have molarity. Okay. Uh, one one.
I'm back. And so here, the units here are moles per liter. Keep in mind, that's another ratio. You know, I've always talked about the ratios, how you can uh, write them as moles per liter and or liters per mole. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> the problem given here says, let's calculate the molarity if 9.99 grams of potassium bromide is dissolved in water to make 2.50 liters of solution. Well, first thing we need to do is figure out the formula for potassium bromide, okay? And so once we know the formula, the correct formula, then we can calculate the molar mass. So my suggestion is write potassium bromide in ionic form first. So that being the case, let me uh, we know that the bromide being in group seven in ionic form is a negative one. And we know that potassium being in group one, when it becomes an ion is a plus one. Therefore, we got a negative one, a plus one. Formula wise, it's a straightforward K B R. Okay, so that's our correct formula. Once we know that, we look up the atomic weight for potassium, the atomic weight for bromide, add them up, and we have the molar mass because we're going to need that to determine how many moles is equivalent to 9.99 grams of potassium bromide. And so we set that up here. We have 9.99 grams potassium bromide. The molar mass of potassium bromide is 119.00, okay? And so here we're dividing by the molar mass. Look, look at my units, keep track of your units. I can't overemphasize keeping track of your units and making sure things cancel out. You can see here that grams cancel, leaving us moles, okay? Moles of potassium bromide. And now uh, just carry all of the digits out. Don't worry about sig figs until at the very end, okay? And so taking 0 0.008395 and we divide it by the volume that we're given which happens to be in liters already, so we don't have to convert anything. Divided through, through um, uh, 2.55, excuse me, 2.50 liters has three sig figs. 9.99 uh, has three sig figs. So our answer should have three significant figures. And our answer is uh, 0 0.0336 moles per liter, okay? And so if I take out 9.99 grams, put it in a special container, glassware, and we has a special mark that's a, exactly two and a half liters, dissolve it up to two and a half liters, its molarity will be 0 0.0336. Okay, so that being the case, let me erase my stuff here. Now, there are a lot of practice worksheets on the website. Practice, 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 you know, knock them out. I, the, the, um, uh, the answers are given, but work them through first. See if you can get through them. And then if there is a problem, you can email me. But since uh, this is literally our last uh, live lecture on Zoom, uh, I mentioned an email that I sent out. I will be here tomorrow and Wednesday from 1 to 2. It's office hours, so feel free to stop by. If you have any questions, we can work through the problems. And here, let's try one last one. We have uh, calculate the molarity. If there are, uh, if you have 5.0 grams of sodium phosphate and you dissolve it, to make a solution that, has, that is uh, 255 milliliters of sodium solution. So 
stepwise. What do we need? We need the molar mass of sodium phosphate, okay? And so, first thing again, we write out the ions of sodium phosphate. Uh, sodium we know has a plus one. Again, like potassium is in group one, so it becomes ionic, okay? It would have uh, a plus one charge. Now, the phosphate, if you forget, just the term phosphate, that phosphide, I-D-E, would be just phosphorus by itself. But they're using here eight. That should direct you to the polyatomic ions, okay? And if you look, look that up, you come up with PO4, and it has a negative three charge, okay? PO4, that is the phosphate ion. So that tells you now that you need three sodium sodiums for every phosphate. So therefore, the formula would be Na3 and then PO4, okay? So now you have the formula, which now you need to calculate the molar mass. I got four oxygens, one phosphorus, three sodiums. Once you got that, you come up, you should come up with 169, 63.94 grams for the molar mass. So taking 5.0 grams of sodium phosphate, dividing by the molar mass, gives you the number of moles of sodium phosphate. Again, keep all the units there, all the numbers, I should say, until at the very end of the calculation. The next step is to figure out the volume because molarity, you remember, is moles per liter, but you're given the problem in milliliters. And so you need to convert milliliters to liters. And remember that they're in one liter, there are a thousand milliliters, okay? And so <clears throat> putting up this conversion factor, and again, keeping track of your units, can't overemphasize that. Notice in the top, grams cancel. Notice for the volume, the milliliters cancel because I'm looking for units of liters. So take 255 divided by 1,000, okay? And if you're comfortable with just moving the decimal point over three decimal places, that's fine, okay? That's not a problem, okay? So now we have the units that we need, the numbers that we need, and then we simply just do the math, uh, keep, 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 mind, keep in mind here the sig figs, 5.0 grams of sodium phosphate, two sig figs, 255 milliliters, three sig figs. So our answer should have no more than two sig figs, okay? So doing the math, if, I, if you take out 5.0 grams of sodium phosphate and you dissolve it with 200, 255 milliliters, the molarity of that solution would be 0 0.12, okay? Now, that being the case, basically what this is now is just a reminder not to forget your assignments, okay? There is a practice final exam on the website. The problems will be very similar. Obviously, the one on the website is you know show the work type but uh, our, our exams are going to be online so those show the work types have been converted for a multiple choice or fill in short answers okay but that's a good resource and then uh my last for disregard that, that was last chapter i will it really oh, well, i want to i take that back yeah my last soon will be wednesday because <laughs> i'll be here tomorrow tuesday and the last one would be Wednesday, okay? Because the final's on Thursday. And that is opened up from, the final opens up at 6 a.m. And it closes up at 11.59 p.m. I extended the time a few minutes. You gotta I believe 110 minutes. It's comprehensive, okay? And so give yourself plenty of time. Hopefully you can find some time that you know, nothing can disrupt you. 
because once you start it, you, you you really can't go back. It's you need to uh, uh, knock it out of one setting. Uh, if you've not done anything, you missed anything, you can still go back and get some points. I mentioned I sent an email about that. Any miss assignments uh, for homework and activities, feel free to go back. Yes, you get a little bit of penalty, but you know. Uh, a little bit of points is better than no points at all because I have to insert a zero to that any misassignment and that will drop if you have a lot of them that will drop your grade. Okay, so uh, it has been a pleasure. I appreciate uh, you three. You three have been constant here and uh, um, all right. Oh, any suggestions you have, you know, because we're on my side of it. You know, a lot of us are just learning how to do this online stuff. We're going to do it again next semester. Uh, and so we're, we're learning too. So I welcome any suggestions you have uh, as far as the coursework. Uh, feel free to shoot me an email. And uh, so any suggestions, I'm more, more than happy to read it. I'm always trying to find ways to make it more interesting and, you know, and, it, and it's tough. This online thing is a whole new ball game for all of us, but <clears throat> we'll get through it. Other than that, congratulations, you finished 15 chapters of chemistry. <laughs> all right, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, still got a little time here, but let me, if not, um, I'll be here tomorrow if you have any questions, okay? All right, stay safe out there. It is crazy. You know, this, this bug has uh, grabbed a hold of my family and it's, uh, it's been pretty tough. So anyway, you guys stay safe. Do you have any questions, any comments, concerns? No? Uh,